Perfect. Well, I am going to go ahead and get us started. Um, so again, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we are in for a treat tonight. Um, and I appreciate you tuning in for the July Wild Speaker Series, all about the importance of the artist in nature. Before we get started, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the lands I'm speaking from are the traditional lands of the Nuwubi or Southern Paiute, where I am in Las Vegas. I also want to acknowledge that our speakers are on the traditional lands of the Washoe and Northern Paiute in what is now known as Reno and just outside of Reno. Uh, these places, these peoples have been living on and with these lands for countless generations and I pay my respects to, to elders past, present, and future, and invite you to take a moment to consider the many legacies of colonization that bring us together here today. So with that, I am Grace Palermo, and I'll be hosting tonight's Wild Speaker Series. I use she, her pronouns, and am the Southern Nevada Programs Director at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Friends is a statewide nonprofit focused on protecting wild lands. Uh, wilderness areas are places that are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people. And we work to protect these lands in a few main ways. Uh, so first we advocate by speaking up for these lands to get them permanently protected and manage to maintain their wildness. We also educate we do that by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events, presentations like this one, and generally finding common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward. Because these lands cannot protect themselves, we work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. So we are very happy that we hold this Wild Speaker Series the first Thursday of every month. And we do this by hosting a local environmental expert or experts for people who are interested in just learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. And tonight we're celebrating the importance of the artist in nature. We'll hear from three phenomenal photographers, John Beach, Lori Hibbett, and Jeff Sullivan. Um, and it's through their lens that people around the world become inspired to visit and protect the spectacular landscapes of wild Nevada. And something that's pretty fun is that these photographers are also partnering with us for Art Town. And for those who don't know, Art Town is a summer arts festival that happens throughout the whole month of July in the Reno area. And it features an amazing 500 events. Uh, so this year, we're proud to partner with Nevada-based photographers, both um, those here with us tonight and some others, and they have captured the beauty of wildlands up in Washoe County. So Friends of Nevada Wilderness is continuing to work to see that those beautiful places in Washoe County are protected. And one really cool thing about, um, you know, seeing different photographers work is that each artist has their own unique view of Nevada and we're really happy to share their pieces by highlighting Wild Washoe in a limited note card set. So everyone tuned in tonight um, and who registered will get an email with a link for the first access if you'd like to purchase those note cards. I will, I will send that out to you tomorrow. And now I'm going to introduce our speakers. So first we'll hear from John Beach. John is a retired environmental scientist from the EPA and has called Reno home for the last 10 years. He's been making photographs for his whole adult life, but got serious about digital photography 15 years ago. Then we'll hear from Lori Hibbett and Jeff Sullivan who comprise the Great Basin School of Photography, teaching workshops that specialize in night photography. They also do time lapse and are proud to call Nevada home. And to end off the evening, I have a few questions that I'm dying to ask John, Lori, and Jeff, and then we'll open up the floor for any questions or thoughts that you all may have. And so very last, I have just a few housekeeping notes before I hand it off. Um, I'm going to ask that if you're not speaking, just keep yourself on mute um, so we can hear our speakers. And if we start to have any bandwidth issues, I may turn off cameras um, just so our speakers come through clearly. 
And then lastly, I do want you all to know that the event is live on Facebook right now and we are recording so that folks who couldn't tune in tonight can watch, watch later on. Um, so with that, if you have any questions or thoughts throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and we, you know, even if you don't have a question, we love just to hear what stands out to you as well. So with that, I will pass it off to you, John. Thank you, Grace. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us here this evening. Um, I am, I feel really honored to be a part of Friends of Nevada Wilderness's uh, Wild Speaker Series and, and part of their Art Town program. And I, I'm really pleased to have my work uh, support the mission of the Friends. Uh, photography, as, as Grace had really mentioned, photography has long played uh, an important role in the preservation of wild places. A good example is, is how it helped uh, prompt the formation of several national parks. Um, and there's so many wild places in Nevada that need protection. So one of the reasons that I work with friends is that I hope by doing so, uh, my work can help people, people all over recognize the wildness, the beauty, and the value of these places, and to motivate them to call for and support protection. So with that, let me uh, see about sharing my screen. And let's select this here. Okay, share, and we'll go to full screen. <clears throat> I love to take pictures in Nevada, in wild Nevada. Uh, and most of the pictures I, I'll share with you here are of Nevada. There's a few that aren't and I'll try and identify them when we get to them. Uh, and while I, I will photograph almost anything, I consider myself primarily a landscape photographer. <laughs> And the Nevada landscape is so beautiful and varied. And it's also for me, it's challenging because it's quite different from other landscapes. Um, we don't have much in the way of, of blue lakes and lush green forests, oceans, fog and rain, green prairies or miles of wildflowers that we often associate with beautiful landscapes. I see different kinds of beauty in Nevada. And it's rewarding for me to, in addition to taking pictures that I like to look at, it's rewarding for me to develop the new skills needed to uh, photograph them. Plus, and this is important for me, uh, taking photos gets me out into wild Nevada. And now um, I'd like to walk you through some more of my photos and, and while I do it, share with you some of the philosophy and themes that underlie the pictures and talk a little bit about how I go about taking them. So what I'm calling philosophy or how I like my pictures to look, uh, I do shoot a lot of different styles, but to generalize, I like simplicity. I like it clean, <clears throat> uh, maybe even spare, often soft and gentle. Uh, I do bold colors and contrast also, but there's something about the Nevada landscape that really calls out to me uh, that is soft and gentle. I like it wide open and spacious. <clears throat> um, it often, and it turns out, um, I like it wide open and spacious. Uh, and it turns out that often that for me ends up being in what's usually called a panorama. I don't shoot panels for the sake of shooting panels, but I let the compositional elements of the image dictate the shape, the, the, the crop or aspect ratio of it. Um, I find that my, I, what I'm often struck by and find that my pictures contain uh, horizontal bands of color, just one of those things that uh, appeals to me, I guess. I also like sweeping lines and curves. I like diagonal lines too. And of course, most photos are a combination of two or more of these things. And, and then there are what I'm calling themes, what I like to take pictures of. I like to photograph landscapes, shoot a lot of landscapes. But 
that's Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> that's Gold Butte National Monument down in the southern part of the state. This is out in the, uh, the desert uh, near Black Rock. But I also like sunsets. Do a lot of sunsets, just the colors are fabulous. I like the moon. The moon will show up in a lot of my pictures because the moon is beautiful and it, it actually, I really like the way it adds something to a, a lot of the, the structure of the photos. I shoot a fair amount of architecture. I really enjoy architecture, but we're talking about wild Nevada and this architecture may be a little wild, but I don't think it's what we're here to talk about. <clears throat> Same here. <clears throat> but I like, <clears throat> The sky, clouds, uh, they bring a, a, a feeling of spaciousness for me. Uh, this one, nice and spacious. Um, plus we get these lenticular clouds uh, so often here in Reno uh, that are pretty unusual elsewhere. A, a friend of mine has often remarked uh, how the sky in Reno always delivers a good show. And as you can see, um, the sky often takes up more than half the frame in my pictures. I like to take pictures of trees also. Tree trunks sometimes, just the trunks. Sometimes the whole tree. I like to shoot at night. Uh, I like to shoot architecture at night a lot. This, this one is not in Nevada, this is San Francisco. Uh, I do shoot the night sky, the astrophotography. But uh, Jeff and Lori are, are the, the king and queen of that, and I'm going to step back, and uh, I can't compete with that. I like color. This is kind of nighttime and color. Well, almost night. Moon, color, horizontal bands of light. So you can see some of those uh, um, aspects of, of the pictures. Color. Yeah, I like color. Simple. This picture reminds me of a comment a, a friend once made in talking about his, his photography. He said, sometimes I just fall in love with the sky. This is the picture I thought of when he said that. This one is actually not in, in Nevada either. It's in the Bay Area. <clears throat> black and white. I like to shoot black and white. Uh, I generally shoot it in color, but often it's with the, I, I have the, I, sometimes, not always, but it's often knowing that I'm going to make black and white out of it. More black and white. Horizontal lines, clouds. Abstracts. And this is actually, whether it's an abstract or a, or a landscape, I'm not really sure, but a lot of the landscapes I do kind of border on abstract. <laughs> I'll shoot people and wildlife from time to time, but it's really incidental to uh, what I, you know, it's generally when I run across it. Although uh, I'll confess that I, I have gone on birding expeditions to take pictures. This, this happens to be one. This I don't think was in Nevada either, but it's a bird. That's not in Nevada, that's the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so how I shoot. What do I, how do I go about taking my photographs? Uh, a lot of my work is uh, opportunistic. I do it while I'm doing something else. Uh, backpacking, for example, in this case. So I have to have my camera ready, charged up, memory available, appropriate lens, accessible. Then to carry it on my chest here. <clears throat> um, I usually use, uh, bring one body uh, with a wide zoom on it. Uh, plus, I usually keep a telephoto zoom handy unless I'm backpacking and it weighs too much and I can't really bear to carry that much weight. Uh, I prefer a, a full frame uh, body, but I'll use a crop sensor body when weight and volume matter, as in this particular uh, picture. Uh, I get a lot of opportunities hiking and, and skiing in the backcountry, for example. <laughs> for that, I, I, I carry a camera. Uh, it's on my chest, strung on my chest, hung on there by carabiners off the yokes of my backpack. Works quite well. It's accessible, out of the way, uh, easy in, easy out. So it's not an impediment to taking a picture. I can have that 
camera out and, and take a picture before the light changes. Usually, not always, because that's important. Sometimes you only have a couple of seconds. Um, and if it's in a backpack, fanny pack or someplace else uh, that's not terribly, really accessible, you're gonna miss a lot of shots and, and just pass on, oh, I couldn't be bothered to pull that out. And uh, so I've learned keeping it accessible is, is really important. When I'm driving, uh, I like to have a camera within reach uh, and I stop the car with some frequency. My wife is uh, very good about this understanding and just kind of grins and bears it, I guess. And sometimes she'll actually suggest, oh, that's pretty over there. And just stop the car. I will occasionally do a photo exposition uh, expedition. I'll get in the car and go somewhere and for a day or two or three or four <laughs> and do very little else besides take, take pictures. Um, maybe see some scenery as well, but uh, just take pictures. I don't do that often, but I, I, I do do that. A lot of my work is repetitive. I'll shoot the same scene multiple times on multiple days. This is the same ridge, the moon over the same ridge under different conditions, different days, different lights, different light. Uh, and if you think about it, how often do you get it right the first time? Sometimes you get more than one nice shot out of it. Here's another example. Same, same place, same, same mountain, different conditions. Nice spot out in the desert there. So I spoke a little bit about panoramas. I, I do a lot of panoramas. This one actually is a stitch, is, is three photos, or three frames stitched together. Um, however, most of my panoramas are made uh, from one shot. I just crop it. Uh, 24 megapixels is, makes it pretty easy to enlarge to five or six feet across. Um, this one uh, could go much larger than that, but um, it doesn't take a lot of pixels. <laughs> Uh, to, to look just fine on a big picture, uh, largely because in order to see the difference, you have to get a really close and examine it. And when it's really big, you don't want to stand really close to it, you want to stand back and, and take in the whole thing. Uh, usually, uh, I'm trying to capture nice images uh, for the sake of the image, uh, but I do shoot documentary images for vacations and the like. And, uh, I don't think I'm really very good at it because I never seem to catch the flow of a trip very well. And my kids always complain that there aren't enough people shots, but I really like the pretty picture shots that I get. Uh, to present my work, I will, let me switch up here. Um, I'll use, uh, this is Smug Mug. Uh, I'll also use Flickr uh, to share on the internet. But I'm not a really big fan of the medium that is the internet for looking at pictures. Uh, sometimes I'll use a tablet computer for people, give them something to hold in their hands, bigger than a cell phone, way bigger than a cell phone, so you see a lot more picture there. But I really prefer prints. <laughs> I like really big ones, but they do need to fit in the room, so that generally dictates the size of the thing. Uh, I don't print myself but I use uh, an outfit called Pixels and Ink here in Reno. Uh, they do a fine job. Uh, I like to have them uh, print uh, and mount borderless and unframed on, on gator board uh, and spaced, have a little spacer behind it so it looks like it floats off the wall. Uh, sometimes I use an outfit in, in uh, Vegas uh, by the name of Canvas Pop. Uh, they print on canvas. Uh, and it looks like an oil painting and it'll be mounted on, on uh, a frame like an oil painting and uh, just hang it up on the wall. So uh, finally, a uh, word about my current projects. I'm trying to capture, I'm trying to get better at capturing the serene beauty and spaciousness of the sagebrush ocean that is so much in Nevada. Uh, I have some here. But I feel like I have a lot to learn. Working that black and white some more, uh, trying to do more black and white, uh, find images that look best in black and white. Uh, 
and bring them up in clouds. Uh, I have a project now where I'm trying to shoot clouds and nothing else. So that you don't, we don't, I don't have the the background or the the frame of reference to put it into. Clouds can be really beautiful, but uh, turns out there, I find them pretty hard to photograph them. <clears throat> and this is the Sagebrush Ocean, but it's one of my favorite shots of Wild Nevada. And now <clears throat> I'll turn it back to Grace and stop my there. And I will thank you all for your, the opportunity to speak with you. <clears throat> and uh, Grace, take it away. Um, thank you so much, John. Uh, I really appreciate appreciate that you like simplicity. Um, that's a, a really neat thing to hear hear someone say. Um, and I think it will bring a new aspect to my own photo taking when I'm out in the wild. Um, so thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And now let's hear from Lori and Jeff. Um, I think we're in for hearing about some night photography, which I'm excited about. Um, and you can go ahead and take it away. You're still muted, Lori. Okay. Can you hear me? Get rid of that. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank okay. You. I'm just trying to figure, I've never done Zoom before, so I'm trying to figure it out. Can you see um, photographs on the screen? Yes, I am seeing a beautiful there, photograph. Wonder. Okay. That's the comet Neowise over Topaz Lake. So what Jeff and I do, before I get just running through a bunch of photographs, um, We've lived in Nevada for over 10 years and love the dark skies that are out here. Uh, it's like nothing else in the country. Um, we both are avid backpackers, as you are, John, and spend a lot of time outdoors. The preference is to be outdoors because I'd rather be out taking a picture than sitting in um, making my picture fabulous by taking bits and pieces from a lot of different shots. I just don't like to do that. I want to have it be what I captured at the moment, but there are tricks to the trade as well. Um, this is a beautiful um, old mill. A lot of uh, the shots that we go in and seek are historic things in Nevada because Nevada is full of a lot of history. And um, if you capture it in the right moment, the right light, it can be pretty stunning. And the Nevada's clouds are just amazing. But there are, are things we do in order to make our photographs maybe pop a little bit more. Like this is probably a three bracketed shots that I put together so that you get the darks and the lights and the 3D effect. And it, it's just a really nice way to present information. Can you look on there to make sure that they see what I, I can't see, see what I see? No, okay. Walker Lake, you know, we were driving by and there was the campground. Um, we travel a lot um, and we typically try to shoot during sunrise, sunset and nighttime in order to capture the, the magical light that Nevada is full of. Afternoon out in Goldfield, I just love the shadow of that Joshua tree. Um, pretty phenomenal place just down by the Santa Fe Hotel and the Santa Fe Saloon. This is another, this is an old stage stop that we love to go and visit when the conditions are right. This is that same mail from a different perspective. Um, of course, everybody knows about Fort Churchill. When there's a magical moment, like a sunset and some clouds and the sun's peeking through, Jeff and I like to just pull over and capture it um, because you're never going to repeat that shot. So you have to just stop. This is, we were driving somewhere and Walker Lake was just having these phenomenal conditions. So we're like, okay, got to go pull over. We just sat there and enjoyed the sunset and photographed it and um, went on our way. 
this is that same evening, every which direction you shot, something the light was different. And, and that's the thing is when you're out shooting, turn around, look the other way. Don't just stay focused on one, one part of the shot because there's magic everywhere. And every now and then there are fields of wildflowers out there in Nevada. This was maybe three years ago um, after we had some massive rains throughout the state and we just came upon, upon these fields of um, mallow. This is um, globe mallow. And every now and then when we drive through here, we'll just see if a smattering of them, but this was just a phenomenal day. So we had to stop and photograph the clouds added a lot of dimension to this, to the shot. Um, roads, you know, this is what a typical Nevada road looks like, a little beat up, but but you're going somewhere and that's what we like. So oftentimes when we're on our way somewhere, the road is the focal point of the shot. It's the leading line into the scene. So having that artistic point of view to present the moment is what we strive for. Here's another amazing sense that we can, we know when there's those clouds out there, we have places that we hurry up and try and get to so that we can capture the moment. But this is this type of a sunset almost every year where we've been in this particular location, we've had something like this. This particular flower, I think it's a wild peach. Um, we were just driving down some road. We're like, okay, where does that road go? And we ended up going up and we found this old mine. And then we came across a rattlesnake going across the road. So we had to get out and video him and help him get off the road. And then we just kept going. And we, our favorite thing is just to go down the road if we've never been there, because you're going to find something really amazing. And this is just one of those beautiful spring days. Um, out in Manhattan, they've got these cool old cars and you just have to get up close and photograph them. And there's the lizards and the wildlife are just phenomenal. So we try and capture those guys as well. They never stand still very long, but you have to be quick. Um, Cathedral Gorge, uh, we've been sent to photograph that for Travel Nevada. It's usually a stopping point on our way someplace else. And we probably need to just stay there and um, hang out for a while. It's such a cool place. We need to recognize more of these unique landscapes in our state in order to a, preserve them and to share their beauty, but not let them get overrun. Um, Great Basin National Park uh, took this a few years ago. I did a time lapse as well. I could probably put some time lapses in the background, but this is a phenomenal, our dark skies are just amazing. Um, and we love to go out and capture them. In fact, Milky Way week starts in the next few days. So we'll be hitting the road. This is a thing called motion blur. And this is up in Great Basin during the fall. I like to take my camera and have a really slow lens and just move it slightly up and down. And if you have a tree in the foreground, then it can be your focal point in the shot. This is a, that same grouping of trees, a different um, interpretation of it in a sepia, Lamoille Canyon in the fall. This is actually not an abstract. This is the snow coming down so hard that as I shot through the car window at the trees. It was just abstract, but that was a pretty good snow falling on oil. Um, Ward charcoal kilns, we've shot them at night. We've shot them with great sunsets. Um, they're a very cool feature and underappreciated, I think. Of course, we have the train yard. And clouds really help. I liked this perspective is kind of being up on the track and getting ready to go on your trip. This is up near Massacre Rim, where you can see it's just absolutely dark, dark skies. Um, for this particular outing, Jeff and I were exploring the area. There was a dirt road, so we went down it and we found this nice little pond. And um, it was hot, the mosquitoes were out. So what we like to do is um, set up our cameras. They've got built-in intervalometers. So it, the intervalometer takes a picture every, whatever interval you set. And so we needed to get away from here. Sorry, this is Donan. 
<laughs> he had to be in the shot. That's my puppy. Um, so we set up the intervalometer and escaped from the mosquitoes and the cameras started shooting when it got fully dark. And I got about 400 frames and put them together in a really nice time lapse. But I'm afraid to put a time lapse up because I don't know that I could get back to this screen. So maybe Jeff can run one for you. Smoky Valley. Further up this valley is um, Round Mountain, this big old pit mine. It would be nice if we could find something better to do than just destroy our environment like that. So friends in Nevada Wilderness, please keep up the good work. Um, I love the layers of clouds that are out there in the storms. This one, the old hangars are lovely. I think Nye County is supposed to be doing something to preserve them so they can be enjoyed for others, but I haven't seen any work on them in the years we've been going there. I like black and white versions as well. Not quite. I think I like the black and white. It just pops. This is another cool location. Um, we don't always push people there because we like that when we go there, it's not busy. And I'm sure you know where it is, Grace. Just another spring day, driving down a road. Look at that, it's beautiful. Take a shot. This is another just funky little pond, but the clouds are amazing and we got wonderful photographs. I think it was full of cow prints and whatnot, but it was worth photographing. This is the same hangars with a Milky Way shot. This is up in the Massacre Rim area. Dark, dark, dark skies. Are we just, that's Nevada. Down in Gold Butte, more Gold Butte. Wildflowers in Gold Butte. That glow in the distance is Las Vegas. So you can tell the difference between the via dark skies, no glow in the distance. And then there's Vegas just going like a nuclear bomb went off. And that's even under a full moon because you can see the moon in the clouds. Gold Butte with Jeff standing out there lighting up himself in the distance. Um, more Gold Butte. Finland. I just love Nevada's dirt roads. They're taking you somewhere, but you never know where they're going to be. Um, this is that our favorite place for those sunsets. When there's clouds in the sky, we rush over there because it's always going to do something magical. Um, around 4th of July and Memorial Day, they put these wonderful flags in the Goldfield or the Tonopah Cemetery. Interesting place to walk around. Um, Berlin. Night sky is beautiful. It's a, it, that's a treasure that we need to preserve. Jeff and I spent a lot of time in Bodhi. Here's an, this is a private head frame that we are allowed to go in and photograph frequently. We bring our clients in there when we do workshops in Nevada. Pioche, I love old brick buildings. Um, we run a lot of workshops in Bodhi because it's such a large cluster of buildings. Um, that are preserved enough that you get the feeling of a ghost town and a historic town, um, and they give us private access at night. So you'll find a lot of our night photography work is there. And we're just looking for something like that in Nevada that we can actually preserve and maybe bring more people out to enjoy the Nevada night skies. So this is an old mill processing plant in Pioche, but it's just sitting there. Um, lunar craters. There's just dirt roads going off somewhere, and that's Nevada's big skies. Another private head frame. And there you can see that's Reno glowing in the distance. So the night sky shots can kind of give you a different, uh, an appreciation for Reno 100 miles away still puts out a lot of light. Um, and I know Jeff has a lot to say too. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it to you. Are you ready? Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Lori. So what All I right. wanted to do was basically uh, drill down, show you a little bit of uh, who I am through what I do, and then uh, I can show you more Nevada, and then I can get to Nevada landscapes, and we'll be right kind of in our, our core topic here. 
So I'll start with a quick shot here. Um, I grew up seeing the, uh, <clears throat> as many of us who have been around a while, seeing the Apollo launches and the NASA launches for uh, the space shuttle. And hold on, I still have to make the zoom window a little smaller. It's just too distracting. And so I developed a, an interest in space and science and uh, the night sky. And um, it was a natural for me when I took up photography to also want to photograph the night sky, the Milky Way, <clears throat> the planets, the moon, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out that once you get, you know, your first uh, dozen or two Milky Way shots, unless you're going to just start numbering them, Milky Way 24, Milky Way 25, you kind of need to have a foreground subject. So you either have to have some interesting cultural artifact, you know, a historical building or site or uh, some landscape. So uh, basically we practice travel and landscape photography both day and night. So this is uh, Berlin, uh, Ichthyosaur State Park. Uh, this is a moon. Yosemite. Um, this is Mono Lake. This is an abandoned mine in Death Valley that very few people know about. Uh, this is Bodhi, where we run four or five workshops a year to get people started in night photography. And Death Valley with uh, bad water flooded. And I'll flip through a few more, but basically most of what we shoot is uh, either in Nevada or uh, within about a five or six hour drive of our home. And occasionally we go on a road trip, uh, like this one's to Arizona. But um, a lot of what we do is what you would think of as, you know, maybe a long weekend trip. And so we've gotten to know the area around our house within, you know, again, that maybe six hour window uh, pretty, pretty well. And we like to show people what we found. So uh, we try to get out in the best seasons, the best light show people some of the maybe historical sites, landscapes, um, and uh, help them understand the techniques we use. So that's kind of just an overview of the types of photographs I shoot. This particular one is uh, Walker Lake, that storm that Lori showed you where we just had to pull over. And um, now I'm gonna switch just briefly to, and I think this might be pretty straightforward, yes. So now I'm in uh, Nevada. This is a Nevada landscapes uh, album. So specifically when it comes to uh, the wilderness concept where you're doing landscapes where you don't include um, many, if any, uh, human features, we really like to put the Milky Way over the landscape or in fact, I think this is a night photography album. Um, this is a uh, Crescent Sand Dunes near Tonopah, the Milky Way Arch. Takes a panorama to uh, many, many shots that you stitch together to get a shot like this. There's a fun story behind this. Well, it's fun now. Uh, we went out to get a sunset shot. And we thought, well, if we just drive another quarter mile, it'll have the perfect composition. Of course, we drove out in the sand and two of us got stuck. So the light on the dune here is the, uh, the tow truck. Uh, helping us dig out of the sand. <laughs> and I, I actually hiked back to, I got my car out and I hiked back to my car because there were some fire rings here and there was wood that we could use to put under the cars after we jacked it up and got its frame out of the sand. Uh, so we had a base for it to, to kind of take off from. So uh, sometimes you have more adventures than you plan for, but you know, you just try to get more prepared the next time to deal with whatever you get yourself into. Um, this is uh, one of those mines that Laurie had talked about. Some friends of ours have. Uh, these are some Joshua trees. Now, a lot of times you get to a nice landscape and there's a city in the distance. This one ha happens not to be a city in the distance. It's the Nevada Test Range. It's 25 miles away. And to me, it's just amazing how much light they put out. Now, I don't know if uh, things are still glowing from the nuclear bombs or they just have a ridiculous number of, of spotlights going, but it's really kind of amazing how much uh, light pollution they put out. Now, technically, if you were on an ocean, you can only see things about 14, 15 miles in the distance. Then the curvature of the earth 
starts to drop away and you can no longer see a boat on the horizon. But this is going 24, 25 miles. So it's two times the distance where you'd actually see the lights. And there's probably some low mountains in between too. So uh, again, it's just kind of amazing what a light dome that a few uh, incandescent lights will put out. But you can see once you look above that, you see the green of the sky. Uh, that is air glow. That's um, oxygen that is uh, chemiluminescent. It's basically a similar process to aurora. And it does happen in uh, middle latitudes like where we are now. And you don't see it with your eye. It's not quite bright enough, but the cameras pick it up beautifully. And it's so thin that the cameras don't pick it up very well straight up. They pick it up more when you're looking at an angle through it sideways because then it's thicker. So you get it at about six or 10 degrees off the horizon to about 30 or 40 degrees off the horizon. And when you get through that cross section of it, you can get a nice, uh, nice green glow. And that's when you know that you've got your color right at night. And uh, let's see what else. This is one of those mines too that we uh, shoot. Some Joshua trees, another mine. This is uh, up near Massacre Rim. We just needed to find a foreground subject. It's all a lot of sagebrush up there. So we found this uh, cat, old cattle loading uh, uh, rig here. This is uh, Cathedral Gorge. Uh, some hangars at an old airport in, uh, in uh, Nevada. Uh, this is uh, Walker Lake at night with the Milky Way Arch. That old stamp mill that Laurie had shown you earlier during the day. Another mine. So basically, we just try to find good subjects uh, under the Milky Way. Now, this is a 2012 uh, camping trip that I took with my kids. We were going out for a meteor shower, and with this cloud going, I thought, well, we better um, start taking some pictures. And the lightning started and it just kind of kept going and kept going. And I was uh, cooking dinner, some steaks over a fire and going back periodically to adjust the cameras and keep the time lapse going. But you just never know what you're going to find uh, when you get out there and, uh, and uh, you know, have your cameras with you. So it's kind of like, um, to paraphrase, I think it was maybe John Lennon said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Uh, that happens with photography quite a bit. You know, light, photography is what happens when you're on your way to, for some other photography. Oh, wait. and uh, you find something that's, that's better or really grabs your eye. So this basically shows, you think of the Milky Way rising, it's not really rising. The Milky Way is just there and the earth is rotating underneath it. So, uh, this is us moving under the Milky Way. So I guess it's on loop. And then this is that same uh, cattle loading uh, ramp up near Massacre Rim. You can see how dark those skies are. It's just amazing. You see so many stars. And so that's basically the kind of stuff we do a fair amount of. Now I'll get into more landscapes. And I think I want to change what I'm sharing. So maybe I have to stop share or maybe it's new share. Let's go find that other. Let's see. Yeah, we have to find. Okay, so now I think I'm into individual landscape photos. Kind of get this window. So Grace, um, I don't want to take too much time. And uh, you know, what's what's our time like? Um, I'd say go for go for it. Maybe another five minutes or so. I do okay. have. A a few questions that I have and then Excellent. also want to make sure um, anybody else can get theirs in there too. Okay, sounds good. So this is a 2006 photo when I first started going on the road and it's literally one of the first landscape photography trips I took when I decided to do it first uh, full time. 
And uh, it was an eight megapixel camera. It didn't have great dynamic range. It's grainy, a little bit noisy. Uh, got some really cool weather here, but the, uh, the pictures weren't turning out very well. Uh, flash forward to 2011 and digital cameras had gotten a whole lot better. This is uh, just a sunrise we woke up to at uh, Topaz Lake. And uh, a lot of times the best pictures come at sunrise or sunset uh, or when you have interesting weather. This was a uh, lightning storm that started near Mono Lake, but we took off after it, did some, did some storm chasing, and we ended up, the lights in the disc here are uh, Coldale Junction. So we're in that big valley there approaching Coldale Junction. And the clouds mixed in with the stars and the lightning was just uh, phenomenal. And then we took a turn south and ended up uh, down in some badlands in Fish Lake Valley and uh, woke up there the next morning and had some great uh, golden hour light uh, first thing in the morning. And then there was this interesting rock formation and it's like, wait a minute, that, that looks too uh, regular. This, this is the, the Round Mountain Mine. Uh, this is on that same trip where they've basically rearranged the mountain into uh, piles of, uh, of rock. We crossed over a pass and went towards Deep Creek and uh, somebody was, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? it, it they were grazing some uh, sheep and we're like, what are those white things all over the hill? And there must have been 400 or 500 sheep all over that hill. And then finally we got back to landscapes away from the, uh, the big vine and the uh, the commercial grazing and got to a really nice sunset over by Deep Creek with a rainbow, some nice clouds, some great sunset light. And uh, that's when you kind of relax and go, ah. <laughs> this is the backside of uh, a Grant Mountain. So we're kind of over the mountain from uh, Walker, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Walker Lake. Uh, we're in the Cambridge Hills here above the uh, East Walker River. Uh, we're near the Rafter 7 Ranch, which I guess is one of the ones that is being donated to the state over time and will become a new state park, uh, encompassing 29 miles of the East Walker River. And uh, there's some really nice territory out there. Uh, I think this is still, they have some kind of um, lifetime usage or something before it fully gets turned over, but in the not too distant future, you'll be able to use more of this, uh, more of this land. Uh, this is Rainbow Canyon, also on the East Walker River. Uh, then fast forward to, uh, to Gold Butte area, again, sunsets and spring. It's a really good time to uh, get some good light and some good uh, wildflower conditions. So that's uh, Gold Butte National Monument. I think it might not have been a national monument when we were there. This is um, Cathedral Gorge uh, with the Milky Way rising or us turning under the Milky Way. Uh, I don't know how this got in there. It's, it's kind of a generic shot, kind of shows, you know, how you can get a nice composition with the Milky Way rising, but it's actually Death Valley. I guess the Nevada component is the uh, Las Vegas uh, air glow in the distance or sky glow, light pollution. Now we're 110 miles from Las Vegas and you can still see the lights on the horizon. Fortunately, we're far enough away. Uh, what would that be? Six or seven uh, horizons away um, that the light dome isn't too high and it's not too distracting. Uh, this is a panorama at the same spot. And once you get to the far left end of the Milky Way, you're almost shooting north. That might be the reddishness, might be a little bit of really high altitude uh, aurora way the heck up there. It's very rare that we see it this far south, but I've actually done, picked up a time lapse with uh, some aurora way up north in Canada that was so high in the atmosphere, uh, we were picking it up down here in Nevada. And uh, the highest altitude aurora is often red, so that's, that's often how you catch it. This is the Cambridge Hills, again, sunset, or Cambridge Hills. This is kind of just a couple of valleys over for, for us, so it's a real easy place to go get some uh, your fix in nature. I just wanted, the other thing that happens when you're out is you see some amazing phenomenon. Now this is 
uh, looks like crepuscular rays where you have sun rays coming out from a point, but usually you notice those looking towards the sun. This is actually directly away from the sun, so they call these anti-crepuscular rays. Now they look like they converge on a point, but it actually is an optical illusion. It's very much like railroad tracks that remain parallel, but they uh, fade out to a vanishing point. So it looks like they're converging. So these are actually parallel above us, um, but they look like they're converging on the distance. So it's a very cool effect when you find it. Um, one of the things we like to do is try to um, advocate for wilderness and for dark sky protection. One of the things I've been pretty active in the last couple of years is advising Mono County and Levining and the residents there and the businesses there to try to keep, uh, try to rein in their light pollution. So the, the big white spot you see on the hill is the town of Levining. They were gonna build a motel complex and employee housing to the left of that on a hill overlooking the lake. And you can see that the entire town of Levining is behind a little knoll, so you really don't see the direct lights, you just see the indirect light. But the housing complex, which was gonna be up to 150 apartments, uh, was gonna be directly on a hill, and it would basically have about the same population as the entire, entire town of uh, Levining. So it was gonna be a much heavier impact on the animals uh, that the birds that nest at Mono Lake, the people that use it, uh, certainly on our night photography workshops and the tourism revenue. There are people out there in the summer almost every night, dozen, maybe a dozen or more people. And that, so that would have been hundreds to thousands of people that would have been impacted negatively. Fortunately, the, the Mono County Board of Supervisors uh, declined to have the housing project built up there at this time. So. Um, we just like to kind of help people make the right decision. So this is more anti-crepuscular rays, this time at Walker Lake, another one of those stop the car, you, we got to shoot that moments. And uh, these are crepuscular rays uh, with some iridescent clouds where you see some rainbow colors on the edges of the cloud. It's often kind of a purple green, in this case, a little bit of blue. And the other thing that is a often a natural occurrence, but unfortunately impacts people are wildfires. It's uh, basically uh, uh, a natural event that we have to rein in sometimes. Actually, a lot of the times these days it's caused by electrical infrastructure, um, but it's kind of an amazing way for nature to refresh uh, vegetation. And you see a lot of wildflowers a year or two after a wildfire. This is uh, Cathedral Gorge again. Uh, we were camping there. There was a wonderful rain shower, rainbow. Uh, this was a very smoky visit to Cathedral Gorge. We had crepuscular rays coming through the smoke. Uh, you don't think this is when the California wildfires about two years ago, three years ago, were, were creating a lot of smoke. And people thought, oh no, you can't breathe. It's no good. But actually you get some really good atmospheric effects at sunset and sunrise. So it's not always a, uh, a bad deal. Um, another thing that's kind of maybe sometimes controversial, people think of solar projects as being very ecologically friendly, but you have to tear up, uh, you know, maybe a thousand or more acres of desert, the tortoises get kicked out, the, uh, the carbon sink is no longer there. Um, and you cover it with basically an industrial site. So, uh, and you create a, actually a, a tremendous amount of local heat. And there are gonna be up to 9, 9 million more acres in Nevada opened up to solar development. And industrial development on that scale will create regional heat from the solar panels. Uh, there's been some interesting esti estimates of what that would do to the Sahara to power Europe. And I think that's gonna apply here too. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I think solar panels are great, don't get me wrong. I think maybe they'd be better uh, shading people's roofs and, and getting your own uh, build down and not tearing up the carbon sinks and, uh, and you know, kicking tortoises off of 9 million acres of wild, uh, wild Nevada. So uh, hopefully that conversation will um, be had more than 
you know, just having it rubber stamped by the legislator. And this is another interesting natural phenomenon. This is that uh, iridescent clouds, which is caused by ice crystals really high in the atmosphere. You get some interesting colors, but this one's caused by the moon. So it was actually a crescent moon rising. We we're getting iridescent clouds in the skies and uh, had to kind of block the moon out so it wouldn't wash everything out, but it was just a really cool effect. And this is that uh, same cloud uh, Laurie and I photographed at Walker Lake, uh, but with the sunset color. And there's the black and white. Basically, you know, there's so much to be seen in Nevada, so many interesting uh, ecosystems and, you know, rock formations, geology. Oh, there's, this is that, uh, that same solar plant when it's not operating. You can see just the scale of the, uh, the building they do there, and they really just cover the land uh, with the bears. This is a mirror-based system where they have uh, um, salt that basically becomes molten when it's heat and heated. So it's kind of a heat transfer system to generate the, uh, uh, the electricity. These are some elk up near Reese River. You just never know what you're going to see. These are Joshua trees uh, in central Nevada and some Mammatus clouds. Uh, this is the sunset that happened just after that. It's just amazing, you know, when you drive into the storm instead of driving away from it, what you see when uh, when the storm's breaking. So you kind of have to, you know, take a little risk and uh, be a little adventurous. Have your tire patch kit in the car and your air pump, and you can pretty much go just about anywhere and see some really interesting things. And uh, the just as a reminder, the Perseid meteor shower is coming up in about oh, six weeks now, mid mid August. And uh, this actually happened to be the Geminids, but uh, we're going to have really good conditions this year, so you might want to get out and do some stargazing in the two or three nights uh, leading up to a meteor shower. This is another kind of impact uh, documentation. We were going somewhere that was on the other side of Sil oh, what is it? Silver Peak. And this is what they've done to the valley. It's a lithium mine, which is important for uh, batteries these days with the chemistry they use. Uh, but it does take an entire valley and turn it into uh, evaporation ponds and um, you know, mineral recovery facilities. So uh, it's not without a cost. Uh, I like my batteries, I like my cell phone, but <laughs> hopefully we can find a way to, uh, you know, not cover too much of, uh, of our beautiful uh, Nevada wilderness with, uh, you know, with, with, with very large mines. This is the, uh, what are they called? This the, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. It's near the Esmeralda Badlands. It's the mountains that are there. Maybe Lori remembers the name. Oh, Monte Cristo Mountains. Uh, and I think that's Calico Mountain there. You can see why it's very reddish. It's on the far eastern side of that range. Uh, this is Monte Cristo Castle in that same range. That's how I remember the name. Lunar Craters. Uh, this is in that same area, the volcanic field around Lunar Craters. And you just get some amazing weather out in Nevada, especially in the summer with some of these thunderstorms we're having. And even if you don't get the thunder and lightning, you get some amazing uh, virga and uh, dark clouds and light, you know, dark and light patches on the horizon and just very photogenic. Well, and then, well, Jeff, if you don't mind, I want to make sure we have some time to get to the questions, but is there absolutely. anything you wanted to, to say to kind of tie things in a bow? Uh, no, just that, you know, we've been exploring Nevada together for 11 going on 12 years now. Um, we barely touched the surface. We can't wait to do more. And uh, we actually hope to uh, pick the brains of some of the folks at Friends of Nevada Wilderness on where we should go next, because it's uh, kind of a win-win here where we love to take photos <laughs> of it and you love to see them. So uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to working with you guys a lot more. Awesome. We, Thanks for having us. We would love that. Um, I'm actually going to go right to one of the, the questions in the chat because it's um, a great one and I'm curious as well. So Rose asks, what is on all, all three of you, your photography bucket list? 
Who wants to go first? Go for it, Jeff. <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think one of the things we've done is we've explored Lamoille Canyon as far as the road will go, but we really want to get up to the, uh, the high country there, the lakes there. Uh, so that's a big one. Also, Arc Dome Wilderness is on our list. And the other area of the state that we haven't gotten to really much at all and we're dying to go is the Jarbage area. Uh, both for summer, there's some nice wildflowers up there, mule's ears and even some lupin. And, uh, and then in the fall, there's some nice fall colors. So we just need to kind of carve out more free time on our schedule to, uh, you know, that something like that would take easily a week or maybe two. So uh, we just kind of have to set it aside when the, uh, when the conditions are right. Awesome. Those are all phenomenal places, I do have to say. I knew um, it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, what, what about you, John? Yeah, I, I'm liking that garbage idea too. Uh, however, I think I first on my bucket list would probably be uh, try to hit some more of the dune fields and playas across the state. There are an awful lot of them and they're hard to find sometimes, uh, but uh, they're really sweet when you find them. Awesome. And is there anything you want to add, Lori? I know, I know Jeff mentioned those were all places you both wanted to go. Well, for the meteor shower coming up in August, I want to make sure that we hit it over Nevada, because a lot of times, you know, we're in the Eastern Sierra and it's easy to pop down to Mono Lake or Alabama Hills, but um, Nevada offers a lot of really unique um, geography that can be captured under a, a meteor shower like that. So we're gonna start exploring um, in the next few days to um, see what we can find. I've had Google Earth up looking at the dirt roads. How do I get where I want to be? And what direction is it for the Milky Way shots and for uh, the direction? The meteor showers are a little bit more challenging to photograph because um, you have uh, where the meteors are coming from, but oftentimes the, the, the longer meteors are away from the, the, the center of the meteor shower. So we, Jeff spends a lot of time using applications to make a determination as to get a specific shot. So I, I can't, I don't know how to bring it up, but um, I'm, there was a crescent moon and Venus and Mars setting, oh, setting at sunset. And we're like, where are we going to capture this? So we drove down to get it over Mount Whitney. And Jeff knew exactly where we needed to be to get the shot. And it was perfect. We were the only ones there. So that's something we always try to do. He sits there and he'll plan and spend hours just planning it. And we'll discuss it and, and put our plans together. And then we go capture the moment. And I think we do a pretty good job of that. And it's the same way we are with our workshops is we know where we want to be and we chase the light rather than chase the agenda. So the agenda is to, is to shoot the light. So we go and um, I have a dozen apps on my phone that show me where the clouds are. And then he has apps that predict good sunsets, good sunrise, and then we go there. So we always like to explore so we know the location where we bring customers and then they get a lot out of their time with us. Absolutely. Yeah, I can only imagine. Um, I know how oh, much it is to, to get out there, and then you have all these added components um, to get get the shot you want. Yeah. So see, there's a we shot a time lapse of that crescent moon and the two planet setting. Oh, got in the car and drove four or five hours and chased it. That is beautiful. Isn't that cool. Very cool. <laughs> Um, all right. One of the one of the questions that I've been curious about is um, either when you consider yourself having gotten started in photography, or maybe when you just started calling yourself a photographer. If there was a particular moment there. Well, for me, um, 
I taught wilderness survival for UCLA and Cal State Northridge about 40 years ago. And after each trip, we would have a post trip party and have a slideshow. And I remember someone saying way back when, wow, you're really good at that. You should, you should focus on it. And it took those 40 years and spending time with Jeff running around being in the wilderness um, much better over time. So he's been a very good influence for me. What about you, John Beach? Well, I was in college and my chemistry lab partner had a brand new Nikon F atomic, the first camera with a built-in, first, first SLR with a built-in meter. And uh, he was taking a photography class. <laughs> and uh, I decided I needed to get me some of that. And so I bought myself a camera and took a photography class. It was all black and white. It's in the dark room. It's all film back in those days because that was a long time. Right. And uh, boy, I just fell in love with it. Uh, and I did a, a lot of photography for several years there. Um, and then when I had kids and stuff, I kind of lost track of it. And then about 15 years ago, I really, really, I, I got my first digital camera. And uh, yeah, my wife got me. A, uh, a nice digital SLR after that. And after that, well, I've spent a lot of money on cameras and lenses since then. <laughs> you should see our house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jeff? Well, for me, my uh, uh, start was, start was uh, I'm getting an echo here. here. <laughs> my, my start was, was in eighth grade. I took a uh, darkroom photography class and um, uh, so that was, I got the basics of exposure and printing and so on and so forth. And then I got a 35 millimeter camera, shot color film. Uh, but the, I could tell, you know, I already had the darkroom experience and I could tell that I really wasn't getting the most out of the pictures I had taken and the negatives. And um, so I really needed a darkroom. So when I graduated from college, I did an internship with Tektronix up in Oregon. And at the time, they were the leader, the world leader in color uh, printing and imaging. And so they did high-end computer graphics on the screen, and then they had dot matrix printers. And it was all very expensive. And I could see how you could scan your uh, images and your negatives and basically have a digital darkroom. So that was a great, uh, I spent five years working for them and that was a great introduction to digital imaging, but the cameras weren't really inexpensive or generally available for about another 15 or more years. So around 2001, got my first digital camera, another one 2004, 2005, 2006. And by 2006, that's when I basically said, well, this is something I think I might wanna do full time. Uh, the early versions of various editing software were coming out. Uh, I went on the road more or less full time, would go out for a couple weeks, come back for a week or two, go out for a couple weeks. Um, and the quality, of course, has come up leaps and bounds since then. It was around 2009 that the first cameras that could really do night photography well came out. Uh, the 5D Mark II from Canon was one of the uh, first ones that could shoot comfortably at ISO 6400. Um, and again, they've gotten quite a bit better since then. So now just pretty much any of the major brands, uh, one of their, you know, full frame cameras, especially with the big sensors, can gather enough, enough light to get a good shot. Hello, Donut. You come over to see me now. Do you want to say hi to everyone? <laughs> okay. Hello. Okay. I got a, a big lap puppy. So, um, as far as when I first called myself uh, a photographer, I guess that would be when I went full time, right? And uh, I pretty quickly licensed a photo to uh, National Geographic, uh, which was, you know, a big boost for the ego and sold a couple of prints. Around 2010, I got a contract to write a book. I don't know if it'll let me show you the book, Photographing California. It's uh, 320 pages. Oh, <laughs> And it's one of those uh, interesting novels, novelties these days. It's, it's actually a paper book. It's not an ebook. <laughs> and uh, 
that came out in 2015. And then Laurie and I, um, I got a couple of awards in 2011. I got Astronomy Photographer of the Year with the People in Space category uh, from the um, Royal Observatory of Greenwich. That's where the home of Greenwich Mean Time is and the Prime Meridian, uh, where your um, longitude starts at zero. And uh, so that was kind of cool. And then I also got a cover of Outdoor Photographer Magazine. I said, well, maybe I should teach other people how to do this night photography stuff. So those two things happened in fall of uh, 2011. By 2012, we launched our Bodhi workshops. We started doing um, Yosemite, Death Valley, Eastern Sierra, and here we are. So I guess it started in 2006, but really took off around probably 2011, 2012 with the workshops. Okay, gotcha. And I guess on that workshop note, um, Danielle asked when you will be having another workshop. Uh, we have one coming up in on uh, July 8th through uh, 11th and 12th at Bodie. And the last Bodie one we did, we actually then, we did three days with Mono Lake Yosemite Bodie, and then we did a couple days in Nevada. So we're trying to uh introduce the people we have high demand for the Bodhi workshops we try to kind of shunt people over in nevada with us too and people are really enjoying that um i see Lori has one of our kids uh we've we had three kids this spring they're actually literally kids goats um and that one uh, has a milky way arch on her Lori, can you show the milky way arch so her name is uh, hather which is a milk god from egypt that is, uh, is uh, also associated with the Milky Way because that is uh, milk in the sky. Yeah. So yes, <laughs> and we also have one that has a little comet on her head. So that's uh, Halley or Haley. And then the, uh, the other one is Luna because she looks like the lunar surface. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> so they were all born like right- theme. <laughs> Yeah, they were all born right before the uh, lunar eclipse. So they all had to have astrophotography names or ast astronomy names. Very cool. So um, yeah, we have a workshop coming up in about a week. And then we're actually taking August and September the, off this year because we figure, although we're going to still go out and take a lot of photography, the fire season's going to be so bad this year that we're just going to have to look at a map and say, well, it's not so smoky on the Oregon coast. Let's go there or whatever. You know, we might fly to Alaska. Who knows? But we got to get away from the smoke that we're, we're afraid is uh, unfortunately inevitable this year. Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, I have, I think, one last question before we close it out for the night. Um, and that is, what is one thing you wish you knew when you started taking photos? I'll jump yeah, I guess up. I, oh, go ahead, John. Oh, thanks. Uh, less is more. Uh, don't clutter up your shots. Um, and uh, yeah, that's probably it. Oh, that's a great, great tip. <laughs> I think for me, from a professional standpoint, rocks, trees, and weather can't pay you. Uh, the other is print sales, especially online, may not be the most uh, profitable business model for most photographers. And there's a corollary in the wine business that says, if you want to make a little money in the wine business, start with a lot of money. So if you want to make a little money in photography, just make sure you have your retirement set up first because you're probably not going to make a killing here unless maybe you do, uh, you know, those new NFTs and cryptocurrency and know how to, uh, you know, get a, a few Bitcoin out of it. Other than that, um, you know, weddings are always a good thing, commercial photography, uh, but all this sexy uh, landscape stuff. Uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of fun, but uh, again, the rocks don't uh, pay their bills. <laughs> that, that sure makes sense. <laughs> what about you, Lori? Um, what is something you wish you knew when you started taking photos? Um, how to get it off of automatic. <laughs> <laughs> There's a learning curve there. A lot of people get a camera and go, okay, now what do I do with this thing? So, you know, learning 
um, auto works great in a lot of settings, but you know, once you put it in manual, you need to know what you're doing. And especially with night photography, because you don't have a lot of light. And also in very challenging sunrise and sunset, um, oftentimes our photos turn out the way they turn out because we'll actually, there's a thing called bracketing where your camera, you set it, and when you push the shutter down, it'll go click, 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 and it'll take seven or nine shots or three or five, but they're the same shot, very quickly done in rapid succession, but they're different exposures. So when you put them together, you capture the darks and the lights. And so that really helps to portray what you were seeing at the moment, because the camera can capture some of that data, but the tools that are available now in the DLSRs are um, amazing. So just learning all of those has been a good thing. And I like, um, I like digital photography because if you mess it up, the shot's free. It's not like you're going to send it and have to send it out and, and have to pay to have it printed. Ooh, yuck, I paid for that. No. So it's free. Take away, <laughs> take lots of shots, and then practice, practice, practice. If you're confused at something, try something, try another setting. And, and then you can go, oh, okay. Mistakes are a good way of learning. Absolutely. I think that applies to so many different things. Exactly. Um, we had a lot of really nice comments in the chat here. So thank you everybody for that. Um, and I'll share one from Facebook as well. Fred said, beautiful photos and that the lightning time lapse was stunning, which I have to agree with. Um, that was thank a you. pretty cool thing. Thank you. Thank you for hosting and inviting us, Grace. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you for joining us and speaking and really to all of you for tuning in as well. Um, we, we love hosting the Wild Speaker Series and we do it every first Thursday, like I mentioned, with various outdoor topics. So go ahead and mark your calendar and tune in next month. Um, and then on a very last note, um, I always like to share that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership-based organization and over 80% of donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife and maintaining hiking trails. So we'd love for you to become a member and join us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. And with that, once again, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, and if there's anything else our speakers would like to share, you are welcome to. We appreciate you inviting us and hosting us, and um, we'll keep spreading the good word on Nevada. Wonderful. Thanks keep for having good us. Work. Yes, thanks for having me, and, and thanks so much for helping keep uh, Friends of Nevada Wilderness uh, an important part of the world around here. Yeah. And if anybody wants to get their cameras out of auto mode, uh, that's what Laurier and I are here for to help you with that. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening.